Welcome to the Cook's Memory. Today, a classic British fish pie. Now I'm not gonna make it in the traditional method. I'm gonna use all the techniques that we know to get the best out of every element of this dish to make the best fish pie we can possibly make. Okay, so to make our fish pie, British style fish pie, there's a few things we're gonna to need to prepare before we start doing any cooking. First thing is our potatoes for the mash, because a British fish pie is topped with mashed potato. Now, you can do it just with potato if you like, that's your choice, uh, but I'm also gonna add some sweet potato in mine. Some people like to put other roots into their mash, uh, some like a, a cauliflower mix. That's completely up to you. I'm also gonna add two pieces of garlic. Now, I know people are thinking there's no garlic in, in a in a British uh, fish pie, and you're right. I'm only adding two little pieces. These two will not be enough to turn this into a garlic mash. Most people won't even tell that the garlic's in there. But what it will do, what garlic does, it's like magic. It just transforms everything, just lifts everything up, just makes everything taste better. Well, almost everything. Um, and it will definitely work in the mash. So I'm only gonna add two little pieces in there and it's gonna make all the difference. And I, I, um, I urge you to try it as well. Okay, the next ingredients you're gonna need for a traditional, classic uh, British fish pie, and you're gonna need one of these. You can add both like I will be doing, is either leeks, and that's just one whole leek here uh, sliced up and washed, or onion. And this is uh, just one large onion uh, diced. Um, now you can put both, you can put one or the other, it's up to you, but one thing's for sure, a classic British fish pie seems to have at least one or the other. Leek seems to be the most preferred, uh, but either way, uh, you can just go with one or the other. The next ingredient we're gonna need is parsley very standard in uh, British uh, fish pie sauces. Uh, so I've only got about 20 grams here, just roughly chopped, and uh, that will give us that classic flavor. Now the next ingredients are not so uh, traditional or classic, they're up to you. You will find them in fish pies, uh, specifically these next two, um, but they're not in a lot of recipes, especially if you look at them historically. Uh, and that's peas and carrots. And I'm gonna add both because I like both and I think they go really, really well in a fish pie. It's up to you whether you wanna include them or not, uh, but uh, I'm going to add them. I think they make a difference. And the next ingredient isn't traditional whatsoever. Um, and I'll give you my reasoning behind it. This is celery, very finely chopped celery, extremely finely chopped. And it's gonna be one of the first things I'm going to be cooking because I wanna give them every chance to absolutely dissolve into our food. Now, I didn't used to add celery into food because I don't like celery personally. And I've said this sort of on other videos and um, on foods that actually do have celery in the recipe, like stews, for example, I wouldn't add it because I don't like celery. And then I realized my stews didn't taste right. So even though I don't like celery and I don't wanna chew on it, I don't like the flavor of it, it makes a difference in the things that you're cooking. It adds something. So for that reason, I'm gonna add it. Now, this actually isn't even in a fish pie, so why am I adding it? Well, if there's one thing I've learned from cooking over the last 20 years, there's something the French, the Italians, and most of the cuisines around the world have figured out, is that the holy trinity of carrot, onion, and celery just go together so well and just lift all dishes. Whether you're gonna say mirepoix like the French or soffitto like the Italians, it makes a difference and uh, uh, really makes things tastier. And that's the point of my recipes. They, they're never about doing the traditional way of cooking. This is a traditional dish, but not the traditional way. The method will be different because we're gonna use the best ways of cooking to get the most out of this food. Which brings me on to the next ingredients, and that's the fish. Now, to make this uh, work, um, you know, with these quantities, you're gonna need about 600 or so grams of fish, and I've got a little over that here because I'm not about to just chop off little ends and throw them away. Um, so you want about 600 grams-ish. Now the traditional way would be to just put everything into a large dish, if you will, and cook it in the oven uh, for a few hours and it will all cook. I don't think many people are doing it that way anymore. The most popular method of cooking this would be to put these fish uh, pieces into milk and slowly cook them off in the, in the milk and then take them out 
and then use that milk to make the sauce. I'm not going to do that either because um, I don't think it's a, a, a good idea. Firstly, you're trying to get a fish flavor into that milk when you make your sauce, and you will get some from this. I just don't think this is enough fish to get enough of a fish flavor from them. But what you will be doing is leaching their flavor into that sauce, which then starts to make these bland, in my opinion. So we're not going to be doing that. The method we're gonna to use today is I'm going to pan fry this fish very fast, very hot, and not cook it all the way through. I do want to finish the cooking as part of the whole pie, but it will be like 50% cooked in a pan very fast to preserve its flavors, and it's just going to taste so much better. When it comes to making the sauce, we're gonna use, as I think you should use in anything that has sauces, is stocks. Now today I'm going to be using one of these pre-packed type sauces, um, uh, stocks I should say, and there's a reason for that. As you guys know, I make my own stocks, mostly chicken stock, because chicken stock is that universal stock that can pretty much go into anything. Um, but I don't have stocks for every, you know, for, you know I don't have a lamb stock and a, and a fish stock, and I don't make this many stocks because, I, you know, I don't use them as often and it's just a waste of time and effort. So for things like fish, which uh, I don't cook that often, as in I don't cook it that often in sauces and that, um, there's no reason for me to have fish stock ready. But that's up to you. If you wanna make a fish stock, by all means make it. But I'm gonna be using this, and I'm gonna dissolve one of these into my milk when I warm my milk up to make my sauce. And that's gonna give me that fishy flavor that I need. I mean, even if you weren't to do this and you followed the traditional recipe, you're just not gonna get enough flavor out of these for your sauce to have that nice fish-like flavor that it needs to have. And you're making these bland, in my opinion. So don't do that, do this, and it'll be so much better. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do is start boiling our potatoes and sweet potatoes. We only want to, uh, cook them just to the point where they're fork tender. So we get a fork to test, and as long as the fork can go straight through and just break them, that's when they'll be ready. Okay, so while our potatoes are boiling up, I'm now gonna cook the fish. Um, you don't have to do that with these particular prawns. As you can see, these are already cooked, but if you have raw prawns, then they're gonna need cooking too. Uh, what I'm gonna do, I wanna cook this on a very high heat, but I also like the flavor of butter. So for this recipe, I'm gonna be using my clarified butter because obviously that can go to a much higher heat than normal butter. If, however, you don't have any clarified butter or ghee, um, then just use oil. Or if you wanna do an oil butter mix, um, just to get a little bit of that butter flavoring in there, then do that, but obviously always be careful that you don't burn the butter. So on a very high heat, I'm gonna add a couple of tablespoons of our clarified butter. Now, while we're waiting for the clarified butter to melt, get a sheet of kitchen roll and dry each piece that you're gonna use as much as you can. You wanna draw out as much of the water as possible because that will lower the temperature of the pan, which we don't want, and it will also add liquid into our pan, which, again, we don't want. Okay, so we're getting a little bit of a smoke coming off of our pan, so we know we're now ready. We can add our fish. Now this is not going to take long at all. Okay, so this has been cooking for about two minutes and that's all it needs. And all we're gonna do now is just transfer it onto a dish for our next use. And we can add our salmon as well. Just give the oil a chance to cool down a little bit. Okay, so the first thing we want to add to this is our celery. 
get it in there, spread it about. It'll help cool the pan a little bit as well. Just as the celery seems to be changing color, we can now add our onions. Make sure they're also coated in your, your butter, your oil, whatever you're using. Now I'm stirring them because I don't want these onions to go golden or brown really. I just want them to go soft and translucent. So I don't want any particular piece sitting on the bottom too much and getting color. Now just as you think they're about to start to turn and start to go golden, that means the heat has come to temperature. We want that heater to come back down. So now we can add our leeks. Just lay those out on top. Gently stir those in. Get them coated as well. In our, in our butter mixture. Put a lid on this if you have a lid or something that can go over the top. We want to leave it for at least five minutes to soften those leeks as well. But turn the heat down, we don't want anything to burn. While we're waiting for the leeks to soften, we can prepare our fish. As we know, the prawns are already ready to go. But what you can do with the prawns if you like, if you don't want to leave them whole, you can just cut them down into little pieces to put into the pie as bits. There we go, our prawns are cut. Now we want to flake our fish. I'm just going to do that directly into the plate. Um, just make them big enough pieces, bite-sized pieces that you would want in your pie. Now tilapia flakes quite nicely um, with a seam here. As you can see this hasn't been cooked all the way through. It's still got some cooking to do but just flake off some, some chunks ready to go into the pie there we go. I'm not making too small. Do the same with your salmon. Now if you've got fussy children that don't eat fish, you might want to make it really small so that they can't tell it's in there. There we go. So now my fish pieces are ready for uh, the assembly of the dish at the end. Okay, so we want to check on our potatoes. Just take a fork, just go through one, see how easy it goes through, whether it breaks. As you can see, it's gone right through and it's broken. These potatoes are perfect. So all we want to do now is drain them completely of all the liquid and then just sit it back onto the pan, dry with no liquid in there, just to let whatever moisture that the potatoes have absorbed, just to let those steam out. Okay, so here they are drained. We're just going to let them sit for a few minutes to just steam out and dry up. You can even turn the heat on and put it on the very lowest setting just to help that along. Okay, so the uh, the leeks and the onions have been steaming in there for a while. It should be nice and soft. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, the next addition to this is our carrots. Now, we're going to we're putting the carrots in at this more later stage because we don't actually want them to soften too much. We want the carrots to have a little bit of a bite to them. And the peas are going literally last minute because we don't want those to disintegrate at all and we want their delicious sweet flavor that the peas have oh and if you did use oil especially for the hard and fast frying there's nothing wrong with you putting a tablespoon of butter in at this stage just to get those buttery flavors in here okay let's just put the lid back on make sure our heat is relatively low low medium low Okay, so at this point, it's been about five or six minutes and the carrots will now start softening just a little bit. It's where we want them to be. Also, if you want, just take a fork and try and fork through and you'll find that the fork will just penetrate, but the carrot keeps together and that's exactly where you want it. Now we want just a small amount of time. Remember the herbs in this are not supposed to be the star. It's just to enhance the flavor of our dish. Um, a lot of people make that mistake. They think, oh I'll make it better, I'll add more herbs or <clears throat> I'll make it better, I'll add more butter. 
and all you do is end up ruining what you're making. Just a tiny amount. Um, again, maybe some people won't even know there's herb in there or they'll be like, oh, there's a herb in here, but I can't tell what it is. It's subtle and that's what we want. Just a subtle flavor, just a hint. Unlike the parsley, which is going to be part of the show. Let's tip in our peas, which are quite cold. and will help bring the temperature down in the pan, which is what we want. So that we can also tip in our parsley. Let's get all of that in there. And mix that around too. veg filling is pretty much done. All we have to do now is turn the heat off, leave it uncovered just until the heat starts coming down because we don't want it to form steam which would hit the lid and then drop back in and make this wet. So we're going to turn, there we go, we've got a nice spread there. Turn the heat off. I'm just going to let it sit like this just for a couple of minutes and then I'll put a lid on but not all the way just still let any steam escape so we don't get any water build up but that's pretty much our vegetables ready okay so it's time to get our mash ready our potatoes have uh, cooked I'm going to use a ricer because I think that's the best way to make mash it's fluffier and just more delicious but if you don't have one of these then uh, just mash it carefully, slowly, get your lumps. Don't overwork it because you'll turn it into a thick glue-like, not very appetizing um, mash, which is what a lot of people do. Try not to do that. We want it to stay light and fluffy. Okay, so I'm gonna crush everything, potatoes and sweet potatoes and bits of garlic alike. Just get as much as you can into your, um, into the ricer and we'll squeeze. Okay, so there we have it, our beautiful potato. Uh, all we've got to do now is mix it up, cream it, make it into a beautiful mash. So first I'm going to add is some salt. You're going to need about 10 grams of salt if you've done about the same amount as me. But nonetheless, do, you know, taste it as you work it and figure out how much salt you think it needs. We're also going to need about 15 grams of butter. So about 15 grams or one large tablespoon. and just a splash of milk. I can't say how many mils, probably 20 or 30. It's something you're gonna to have to judge because it's gonna be different to the quantity of potato or whatever you have. It's not a lot. So about that much, just to begin with. And now with a fork, try and stir all of that in gently. You don't wanna disturb this too much. We want it just to come together. If you overwork potatoes, they go very strange and very unpleasant. Not that most people can tell. I think most people are used to poorly made mash, probably by their parents, I know I was. Um, and you've got no idea how it's supposed to be. And it ends up being this very gummy stuff. Just carefully work it in. Okay. What we can do now is taste it. The salt is spot on. The butteriness is spot on as well. Doesn't need any more of that. Okay, once we've got our mash roughly where we want it, the consistency is about right and the taste is right, all we need to do is add two egg yolks. So once we've got the egg yolks in, all we've got to do is just slowly work it into the mash. Now what the eggs will do as well as help our mash as a topping get a color, 
but it will also help stabilize it so it doesn't become a runny mess when it's cooking because mash has a tendency of doing that and it will hopefully give us a nice crispy top because what good is a mashed potato topping if it isn't nice and crispy on top okay so our mash is ready for the topping okay so the first thing i'm going to do is take my 650 mils of milk and this is a full fat milk i'm just going to put it on the slow burner here on the little on the little one just to bring this up to temperature so under no circumstances do we want this milk to boil you don't really ever want it to go above 70 degrees c the only thing i'm going to do and I'm going to add now the fish stock, just direct. Let me put it over here so at least you can see. Um, I'm just going to add it directly into this milk. And just every now and again with a fork. There we go. And every now and again with a fork, just stirring so that it dissolves into the milk. Okay, to begin to make our sauce, let's turn our heat on. We want to add 25 grams of butter straight into the pan. Okay, once we've got the pan up to temperature, just turn it down to a medium heat. We want it to be still quite hot, but not enough to burn the butter now. And we want to add our 25 grams of flour. And we want to start whisking immediately. We're going to get these kind of granulated bits of goo, but keep stirring <clears throat> because you don't want anything to stick to the bottom. We don't want anything to burn at the bottom. And we're trying to cook out the flour. If you've watched one of my other videos, you'll know what that means. If you haven't, basically, cooking out the flour means we're waiting for a strong biscuit-like, cookie-like aroma. Okay, with our milk sitting next to us and warming up, we can now take a small ladle and just get a small amount of that milk and just drizzle that into this while stirring all the time. Remember, we don't want to burn anything, so just keep stirring. Once the milk's been incorporated, we can add another small drizzle and just keep stirring, always stirring. Once that's been incorporated, another drizzle. And you're just going to keep doing that. Okay, with all that milk now incorporated, we have a very thick, but still quite runny sauce. So I'm just going to cook it for a little bit longer, just to make it a little thicker. But don't forget, it will thicken a little more once it's in the oven. But not initially. When If you try and eat this pie straight out of the oven, this will be quite runny. But it will thicken with, with it standing. Now, if you want this to be cheesy, this sauce, I'm not going to make it cheesy. But if you want it to be cheesy, you don't add the cheese until the very end, once you've turned the heat off. Otherwise, you run the danger of actually cooking cheese. And I'll probably make a video about that because people, I think, get that wrong. What you want is cheese to melt into things. You don't want to cook them into things. It's a very different taste experience, especially for some cheeses. I don't think they're very nice like that. Um, so yeah, if you want this to be cheesy, what you should do is once we've made the sauce to our consistency, turn the heat off and then you can add your grated cheese in and stir that in. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna taste this for salt and pepper. Could do with just a touch more salt, but not a lot. Don't forget that the stock cube you would have used if you're using a shop-bought stock is quite salty. If you made your own stock, obviously, then you're going to have to add some salt. It's up to you what pepper you want to use in this. If you use a black pepper, it will, of course, have specks in it. The tradition really is to use a white pepper, so I'm just going to put a little... Just a little white pepper into this. Not a lot. We don't want it to be particularly spicy. Let's taste it again. Beautiful. 
Okay, now what we need to do now is put a lid on it so it doesn't form a skin. And now we're ready to assemble our pie. Okay, now we can start assembling our pie. First thing I'm gonna do is get the fish into my dish. There we go, and just lightly spread them all around so they mix. So you've got a bit of salmon, a bit of prawn, a little bit of the haddock or cod, whatever you're using, and just lightly spread it around. If you see any spots that are looking devoid of something, just get it in there. There we go, and now we've got some nice big lumps of fish everywhere. Take our pan and just spoon it in. Okay, now we want our cream sauce. And initially what we're gonna do is just pour it on and then we're gonna carefully mix it in. Okay, so just gently with a spoon just start to work it in. Okay, so there we have it, fully mixed. All we've got to do now is get our potato topping on there. Okay, so there's a number of ways now to get our mash topping on this. I personally prefer to pipe from a bag um, because it's, I've got this shape on here. It's gonna produce more peaks and that's more bits to go crusty and crispy in the oven. Uh, but you can, of course, if you don't have a piping bag, just spoon small amounts right across the entire pie. Get all your spooned amounts on there. And then using the back of the spoon, you can feather and make it all smooth. And then with a fork, you can use a fork to ruffle edges and um, to create those peaks uh, for crisping in the oven. But I'm gonna use a piping bag. So with your preheated oven, about 180 degrees Celsius, uh, we're gonna cook this off now for about 20, 25 minutes. It all depends on how nice and crispy our potato topping is looking. If it feels like it needs a bit more, cook it a bit more, you're not gonna hurt it. So let's get this in. So the pie's now out of the oven. I'm gonna spoon out a small portion, give it a taste, see what it's saying. Uh, but remember, the longer you let it sit, the more chance it has of, you know, coming together. Right now it's going to be really hot and more than likely just going to spread all over. But um, let's give it a go. Mm. Why I love doing it this way is that the fish has an incredible texture. A better texture than it does if you boil it or you cook it in, the, in, in a fluid or in milk. The potatoes are delicious. Mm, that's so good. I thoroughly recommend you try it, but do your adaptations. I can imagine some cheese on here. That would have been fantastic. I know with feta and spinach, for example, it's really good too. Just play around with it. Anyway. Thank you for watching.